Last week our elders and deacons met to discuss the various options and appropriateness of how we would go about uh, reopening fully as a church. And uh, of course, many of you parents and volunteers had filled out uh, some uh, survey for us, and we appreciate that. We got some feedback that way. And we were thinking at first that with school reopening that we would maybe try to also fully reopen uh, at the beginning of September. But after further discussion, we, we thought maybe we, better, maybe we better wait a month, see how that goes at school and other places. Um, and so right now, the plan is for us to uh, try October. And in October, uh, if things go well, we will uh, begin holding children's church. We'll do it slowly. We'll do it incrementally. We'll start with children's church during this hour. And uh, if that goes well, uh, then we will eventually add our second hour, which is Sunday school, both for the children and also for adults. And so we need to take it uh, slowly, obviously. We need to uh, see uh, what happens, if we can adapt to that. Um, so that's our plan at this point. Now, we have decided to reopen the nursery, but in a, in a very limited way. In other words, if you are a parent, if you are a grandparent, and you have a child, a, a baby, a toddler, who you feel needs to at least get out of here a little bit, um, too fussy or something, uh, you are welcome to go into the nursery area. Um, but we won't be staffing it. There won't be other people in there for you to come back and leave that, that baby or child. But it is open for you to use. It's been thoroughly disinfected and cleaned. Some of the toys have actually been removed. We'll continue to do that so that it's safe for you. But if you feel like you need to do that, uh, just go ahead and use the nursery. So we will keep you updated on uh, continuing changes and plans as, uh, as time progresses here. Now I'd like to ask you to take your Bibles. I hope you brought your Bible. If you did, look on with someone next to you or take one out of the uh, chair rack in front of you. Let's get a Bible in front of us this morning. Because we are in John chapter 16. As we progress through the Gospel of John, we've come now to chapter 16, which is a continuation of what Jesus has already been talking to us about in chapter 15. This morning, let's look at the first 11 verses. So let me read those, and you can follow along in your Bible. John chapter 16. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and about righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Let's pray again. Father, 
Lord, we are living in difficult times. As we look around us, we see the fractures in our own society. And we know that the world is hostile. You have said that the world is hostile to you, to your Father, that it's hostile to us and to the truth. And Father, we can only pray that your truth will break through in these times. That there is so much disagreement and dissension out there. So many voices. When we turn on our TV, pick up the newspaper. And yet, not all of it is truth. And we need your truth. And that's why we need your scripture. We know that your scriptures throughout, from beginning to end, every single word, every jot and tittle, everything in your word is truth because it came from you. You are the truth and you speak the truth. So Father, as we open this passage this morning, we need your Holy Spirit to teach us that truth. May we see things that maybe we have not seen before. May we look at each sentence and each word in a way that we're open to you and ready to receive that truth. And I pray, Father, that when we're finished this morning, that as we leave here, we will see truth that we want to incorporate into our own lives. And so we thank you now in Jesus' name. Now, if we come to chapter 16 and verse 1, a continuation of what we have been looking at the last few weeks, we may see that the disciples are thinking about what Jesus is saying. And I'm putting this into the text, but it seems clear that they might have been wondering about what was Jesus talking about here in terms of the world's hatred and persecution? Why in the world was he bringing this up at this point, hours before he would die on the cross? I think Jesus actually anticipated this question. And so in a sense, he's going to answer that question even before it comes off their own lips. Because he says in 16 verse 1 that he wants to help them to keep from stumbling. Now look closely at text as we begin this morning. He says all of this, all of this is everything that he's been saying in chapter 15. He says all of this I have told you so that you will not fall away. And that's the purpose. That's the reason that he's going to go on and teach what he's going to teach. Now the NIV that I've just read here renders this word as fall away. I think that's okay and that's appropriate, but I actually think there's a, a better rendering of that word, a better translation of that word from the original. The better translation of that Greek word, I think, is the word stumble. I say that because this word means to be caught in a trap. And it has a nuance of being taken by surprise. You know, when you stumble, you don't expect to stumble. And that's why you're taken by surprise. And that's what this word means. It doesn't mean a gradual falling away. It means to stumble. And so that's the word that Jesus begins with here. I've told you this so that you don't stumble. Now I think in the verses that we're going to look at now, if I was to wrap that up at the beginning here, it's something like this. That what Jesus wants to teach these disciples is that they're living in a hostile world. And because they're living in this hostile world, it's important that they not stumble. And the way that they 
do not stumble is by doing three things. The three things is what he's going to list out here. Now the first way that we do not stumble is that we need to face the fact that we will be persecuted and hold on to your chairs. We may even be killed. Now look at verse 27 in chapter 15 as he ends chapter 15. Of course the original text did not have these chapter divisions. But in verse 27 he says, and you also must testify. And we saw last week that the you in the context is obviously the 11 disciples that he's speaking to. But it has a wider application. And the wider application is every believer, every Christian must learn to testify, must learn to be a witness. You see, it's in God's plan, it's God's intention that every Christian testify to the truth. Now if you expect that everyone in this hostile world is going to welcome your testimony and your message, you're going to be in for a very rude awakening. Because they're not. Sometimes we may be surprised because of our persecution. And especially that that persecution actually comes from the religious world, from those that we would expect would, would receive our message. And yet they are the very ones Jesus is going to go out to say here that may be the ones that persecute you the most. We may even be rejected to the point of being excommunicated. That's what he says, putting out of the synagogue. In other words, disassociation with who you believe are those that would be most receptive. Maybe even other believers. Martin Luther is probably the most famous example of this kind of a situation. And I know that you've certainly heard that name Martin Luther, the historical Martin Luther who lived in the 1500s, but you may not know his whole story. And I'm not going to tell you the whole story this morning, but, but maybe you've put together at least or heard that here is this Catholic monk, of course everyone's Catholic at that time, here is this very learned Catholic monk who writes out 95 statements. They're called theses, but they're basically one-line statements, 95 of them. And he goes and nails them on the front door of the local Catholic church. People read them, and they're astounded. And those 95 theses begin to be circulated and published throughout Germany and throughout Europe. And the Catholic Church, the hierarchy, gets wind of it. And what do they do? They call Martin Luther before a tribunal. And they charge him with heresy. How can he say these things? And so... In the end, they excommunicate him. And in fact, Martin Luther has to run for his life. He goes to an area where he finds a German prince who is willing to put him up in his own castle and to protect him for the kinds of books and things that he's writing and saying. And so here we have the religious authorities of his time persecuting, even to the point, if they could catch him, to death, Martin Luther. He was in fear of his life. Now, Jesus predicted that there may be some that would even want to kill us. He says, they're going to put you out of their synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering service to God. You see, persecution under these circumstances, even to the point of death, 
was already beginning when these words were written. Shortly after Jesus' death, Stephen, the first martyr, the one that we find in the book of Acts, he is stoned to death. And then James is beheaded. And then we come across in the book of Acts the story of this guy whose name is Saul. His name is going to become Paul, but his name is Saul. And he's a Pharisee. He's very, very zealous for Judaism. And he goes and receives papers from the religious authorities in Jerusalem so that he can travel to Damascus in Syria and there persecute apparently a group of Christians that had sprung up there. But we know the story that on his way to Damascus, the Lord, the risen Lord Jesus, confronts him. Now what happens when he finally gets to Damascus? Because now he's a believer in the risen Lord Jesus. What happens? They persecute him. They persecute him to the point where he has to flee for his own life. And so even after Saul's own conversion, the Jews are seeking to persecute him. You know, religious authorities and religion has always been a major perpetrator of persecution. And we can see this down throughout all of the ages. You see, those who think that they're offering service to God are out there trying to kill those who are speaking the truth. And Jesus now pinpoints the heart of the problem in verse 3. He says in verse 3, they will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. Now he's already said this in chapter 15. Why do they hate you? Because they hate the Father. They may not say those words, but they really do. They hate the Father, they hate me, and they're going to hate you as well. And so Jesus, again, lays it out to these disciples. Now, the key to enduring this kind of persecution, Jesus says, is simply to trust Him. And He goes on in verse 4 and says, I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. You see, he knows the future. And he knows that the trials that we will face as we serve him, and so he warns us. He warns us in advance that we need to trust him throughout these trials. And when Jesus was with his disciples, you know, he was like the, the lightning rod for all of that persecution. But after he returned to the Father, they would be the ones catching the brunt. They would catch that opposition instead of him. And so what Jesus is saying here at the outset is that he's speaking these prophetic words to them, to us, so that we will both be forewarned and forearmed. In other words, it will not be easy to be a faithful witness to Christ in this hostile world. And so he's telling them this ahead of time. He's warning them this, that persecution will come to them. Now you may be thinking, I don't think persecution has really come to any Christians here in the United States. At, at least in my life. <clears throat> and that may be true. In the last 50, 60, 70, 80 years, we as Christians have lived relatively free of persecution, at least in this country. But I looked up some statistics this week. They come from Voice of the Martyrs, which is probably the foremost Christian organization that tracks these things. And look at some of the 
facts that come out from 2019 about Christian martyrs and persecution. For example, they say that 260 million Christians in the world experience high levels of persecution for their choice to follow Jesus Christ. High levels of persecution. As you break that down, what they're saying is that one in nine Christians in the world experience these kinds of levels of persecution in their life. One out of nine. As they tracked it, they can clearly identify 2,983 Christian believers who were killed for faith-related reasons in the top 50 countries that are on the world watch list. <coughs> They've identified 9,488 churches or Christian buildings attacked in these same top 50 countries on this watch list. And they found that the primary cause of persecution is Islamic oppression. Now, I have found that true as I have traveled to Indonesia more than 20 times in the last 15 years. And even though I myself have not experienced that persecution, it's not illegal in Indonesia to be a Christian. Yet, because it's a Christian, a Islamic dominated country, 90% of all people in Indonesia claim to be Muslims. Because of that atmosphere, because of the teachings of some of the more radical elements there, Christians in Indonesia are very much afraid. And they tell me about it. And some of them have experienced that persecution. Christian churches are torn down, they're bulldozed, they're burnt down. Christians are driven out of villages and areas. Christians have been martyred and killed in Indonesia. You see, we take these things that we're safe for granted. And yet, Jesus is warning us and saying, there's going to come a time when it's going to visit your doorstep as well. And I'm not here this morning to fear monger, but I am reading the scriptures and I am hearing what Jesus says. He is forewarning us. Because we live in a democracy in a free country right now doesn't mean things can't change. And I don't know when they'll change. I'm not predicting how they'll change. But I do believe that it will change. I don't know whether it will be in my generation yet, or the next generation, or my grandchildren, or way down the road. But I do believe that Christians everywhere, worldwide, including this country, will be persecuted and may be killed for their faith. Because one in nine right now are experiencing that. In fact, for 19 consecutive years, North Korea has ranked number one as the world's most dangerous place for Christians to live. And for those few that have escaped from North Korea and tell the story there, it's horrifying. It truly is horrifying. Some more facts about Christian narratives. Here are the top ten countries where Christians face the most violence. And I put them up here all at once, but you'll see North Korea is first, Pakistan, Nigeria, Nigeria there in, in Western Africa has some very, very violent persecution going on against Christians. Egypt, 
Central African Republic, Burkina Faso, Colombia, Colombia, Cameroon, India, Mali. A lot of those are in Africa. Great upheaval happening in Africa. And I've seen Indonesia, what's happening in the largest Muslim country in the world. You see, what Jesus is saying is that persecution is going to come. And we need to face that. And face that fact that it will ultimately come to us. Now he goes on in the passage, and the second thing that he says is that in order to be a witness in this hostile world that we're living in, without stumbling, that we need to focus on the Lord's glory and not our own needs. This is in verses 5, 6, and 7. Now, I don't think the disciples were thinking about Christ's return to the Father and His glory. He's been telling them that that's what's going to happen. But I don't think they're, they're thinking about that, but rather about their own sorrow that Jesus was not going to be with them any longer. Verse 5. He says, none of you ask me, where are you going? He's been telling them, I'm leaving you. I'm going back to the Father. But he says, well, none of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, <laughs> you're filled with grief because I've said these things to you. You see, they were focused on their own needs, not on Jesus' glory with the Father. Now, at first glance, the words, none of you ask me where are you going, seem to contradict John chapter 13 and verse 36, where Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? It would seem to be a contradiction there. Or in John chapter 14 and verse 5, where we saw Thomas say, Lord, we don't know where you are going. And yet Jesus says here, none of you are really asking me that question. And all I can conclude is that Jesus knew what was behind their question, what they were really asking. And neither man apparently was really interested in learning where Jesus was going as much as in protesting that he was leaving them. So in effect, what the Lord is saying here is, you know what, you're just focused on your own sorrow. Sorrow over my leaving you. And to be an effective witness in this hostile world, we need to take our focus off of our own feelings, our own needs, and focus on the Lord's glory through the spreading of the gospel to all our nations. Even if we're persecuted, His glory should be our aim. If we're persecuted, we should not be holding up, thinking, how can I get out of this? How can I fight this off? How can I compromise? What can I say? How do I keep my family safe? Well, Jesus is saying, you're just thinking about yourself and your own needs. <coughs> Think about his glory. What glory for Jesus can come out of this? So focus on the Lord's glory, not on your own needs, Jesus says. Now there's a third thing that he says. And the third, to witness in a hostile world and not stumble, we need to Further the Holy Spirit's work of conviction. And this is the balance of our passage from verses 8 through 11. Now in these next verses, Jesus indicates a major change in the ministry of the Holy Spirit to and through believers. We saw, for example, back in chapter 7 and verse 39, where Jesus spoke of the Spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive, it was yet future, for the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. 
And so John, in a sense, gives us a glimpse of what he knew as he wrote this years later, what was really going to happen. And then Jesus told the disciples in chapter 14, I will ask the Father, he will give you another helper, counselor, advocate, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. And so twice now in the Gospel of John, we have this, in a sense, prophecy that the Holy Spirit, the Advocate, is coming. And the Advocate is going to have certain ministries and responsibilities. Now, when did that change occur? It still has not occurred even here yet in John chapter 16. When does it occur? Well, it occurs on the day of Pentecost. It occurs after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. When the Holy Spirit descends like a dove, it wasn't a dove, but it seemed like that, like a dove, he descends on the apostles and disciples in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. And just as the risen Lord made it clear, a major role for the Spirit is to empower Christians to bear testimony, to witness. In Acts 1.8, Jesus says, but you will, because that day of Pentecost had not come yet, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and all of Judea, in Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. And then Jesus was taken away into heaven, the ascension. Jesus is telling his disciples to wait there in Jerusalem, that they're going to receive the Holy Spirit, and by receiving the Holy Spirit, they're going to receive that power. Now, in our text, we first need to understand what Jesus meant when he says he will prove. He will prove. Now, look at verse 8. When he comes, he's speaking about the advocate, the Holy Spirit. When he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. And the NIV, again, translates this in a way that may seem a little bit different if you have read your Bible for many years, maybe another translation in which the word convict was normally in that place. Many English translations use that word convict. It's very appropriate because the Greek word means to expose something, to convince, or even to use the word convict. So the Holy Spirit is given to convince us to convict people. It's a legal term. It was used when an attorney presented this case in such a, a clear and forceful way that the truth of his client's position became very obvious. In other words, it carries the meaning of a cross-examination for the purpose of convincing, of refuting an opponent. And it carries the idea of a conviction an awakening of a consciousness and proving someone's guilt. And that's the idea that Jesus is saying here. That when the Holy Spirit comes, He's going to do this special ministry in the world. As I was reading this week, I came across a quote by Dr. Charles Ryrie. Dr. Ryrie was with the Lord now was for his entire grown lifetime a professor of theology at Dallas Theological Seminary. Wrote many influential books. And in the late 1970s, he put many of his ideas down as notes 
along with the New American Standard Bible, it became known as the Ryrie Study Bible. Some of you may have one of those. Great notes to follow along. And here's what Dr. Ryrie says about this verse and this idea. To convict means to set forth the truth of the gospel in such a clear light that men are able to accept or reject it intelligently. That is, to convince men of the truthfulness of the gospel. That's what Jesus has in mind here when he says that the Holy Spirit is going to come. He's going to do these things. Now, Jesus says that this new ministry of the Holy Spirit involves three things. He's going to convict the world specifically regarding the er three areas of truth. And the first one is the one sin. And the one sin is unbelief. As he goes on, he says about sin, because people do not believe in me. Now we have to be very careful here to understand Jesus' words. The Holy Spirit does convict people of their sin. All of their sin. But Jesus is pinpointing one specific sin here. Notice it's not plural, but singular. And he identifies the root of all sin. And the root of all sin is that people don't believe in him. It's striking that the world generally would not view unbelief in Jesus as a sin at all. And yet Jesus names this as the sin that the Spirit will convict of the world of. This, he says, is the greatest sin. And this is in fact the sin that the Holy Spirit is convicting people about. Let me illustrate it this way. If you were out in the middle of the ocean, and you, for whatever reason, fell overboard into the ocean, and the boat that you were on sailed off, leaving you in the middle of the ocean, it wouldn't matter how good of a swimmer you really were. Because if the nearest land were hundreds of miles away, you would still drown. Even if you were the best swimmer in the world, you would still drown because you can't swim that far. It's only a matter of time until you drown. But if a rescuer came along and threw you a life preserver, the issue is no longer can you swim long enough to make it to the shore. That's not the issue anymore. It doesn't matter at that point whether you can swim or whether you can't swim. There's only one issue now. Will you take the life preserver? Because you can't swim well enough, the life preserver is the only possible means for your salvation. So it comes down to one question. Are you going to take the life preserver? Or are you going to reject the life preserver? Are you going to reject it by saying, oh, I'm a really good swimmer. I really don't need that thing you threw to me. I'm going to swim my way out of this. I can do it. Or are you going to say, it doesn't matter how well I swim. I can't do it. I have to grab on to that life preserver. Now Jesus Christ is that life preserver. And God has thrown you that life preserver. But some people persist and they say, I'm a really good swimmer. I really don't need that Savior, that life preserver. I'm going to swim my way out of this. You know, I do lots of good things. God's not going to reject me. And so they never grab the life preserver. And there's people in life that even though the life preserver is floating right in front of them, they've heard about Jesus, they even know the gospel, 
but they will not, out of their own pride, grab that life preserver. And the result is, they will perish. They will drown. You see, rejecting Jesus Christ is like rejecting that life preserver. And the sinner who does that has absolutely no chance of living. And so the Holy Spirit has come to convict people that the life preserver is right there in front of you. Don't reject the life preserver. Don't reject Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus goes on because he says that the Holy Spirit is going to convict people of sin, but he also says about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. <clears throat> now, what's the connection? Well, it's the one standard. And the one standard that the Holy Spirit is going to convict us of is Christ's righteousness. You see, Jesus himself is the standard of righteousness. Any human attempts at righteousness are all going to fall short. And the only standard of righteousness that God accepts is his own son's righteousness. Jesus never sinned. He always obeyed the Father. And he is the only one who can die in the place of sinners because he himself had no sin. That's why the sinlessness of Jesus is so important to our faith and understanding. And when the Father resurrected Jesus from the dead and he returned to the Father, as he's talking about here, God put his stamp of approval on what Jesus had done on the cross. And so he resurrected him and he's ascended back to the Father. See, the Bible is clear that God now imputes the very righteousness of Christ to every sinner who trusts him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, he's not just taking away our sin, he's also giving us something. So in Romans chapter 4 and verse 5, Paul says, But to him who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. And so, while our sin is taken away by Jesus, that would simply leave a blank slate. And the blank slate in itself is not good enough. Now we have to have something credited back into that little slot in the Excel sheet. Now we need to be credited with Jesus' righteousness. And that's what he's talking about here. Because at the moment that any sinner trusts in Christ, his sin is charged to Christ, but also Christ's righteousness is put back in us. And so Jesus is saying concerning righteousness, because it's only the righteousness of Christ that can save us. Our own attempts at righteousness won't do it. We must accept His righteousness. And then there's a third thing that the Holy Spirit convicts of. And it's the one danger. And the one danger is in verse 11. He says, and about judgment. Because the prince of this world now stands condemned. The one danger is judgment. Where sin and righteousness meet, judgment follows. And so Satan is the ruler of this world. We've seen that. We've seen that in several places. 
And he was judged at the cross. And now Jesus speaks as if it's already been done, even though it would just take place the following day. And at the cross, Satan's doom was sealed. The sentence was passed, both for him and for his subjects. And we've already seen that the world is in the grasp of Satan. So since Satan stands judged, what chance is there for a mere human to escape God's judgment if his grace is rejected and refused? John 3.18 says this, He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The Holy Spirit convicts the world about judgment. It's the one danger. And for those who reject Jesus Christ and the grace that he offers, the danger that's surely coming is God's judgment. As surely as it fell upon Satan, it will fall upon you as well. Now, going back through these couple of verses, did you see the progression. There's a very clear progression here. And what Jesus is saying is that the Holy Spirit's ministry to the world, to unbelievers, regards sin, righteousness, and judgment. Because unbelievers need to see their state of sin from God's perspective. They rejected Christ so far. They need to know that the only righteousness that they can have is the righteousness of Jesus Christ to save them. And thirdly, they need to be reminded that they face certain judgment and eternal punishment for rejecting Christ in his offer. So the Holy Spirit comes. And the Holy Spirit has a ministry to the world, to a hostile world. And it's regarding sin and righteousness and judgment. So when we talk to people, when we witness to people, when you have that opportunity to tell them something about your faith and about Jesus Christ, our witness to those unbelievers, and it's going to happen through the power of the Holy Spirit, needs to include those three things. Now they may not all happen in the same conversation, but it needs to include a conversation about sin, especially about why are they rejecting Jesus? It needs to include something about Christ's righteousness, that they don't have enough righteousness in themselves. God won't accept their righteousness, only Jesus's. And thirdly, about the danger of judgment, that if they persist, if they want to go through life and reject this, not grasp onto that life preserver, then there's judgment that is coming. We need to talk to them about these three things, sin, righteousness, and judgment, obviously along with faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, because that's the only remedy for their helpless condition. And Jesus is saying to the disciples here, that there's a new ministry that the Holy Spirit is going to embark upon when he comes. And he's going to empower you. He's going to witness through you to the world regarding sin and righteousness and judgment. I'm not going to have you turn to this story. It's in Acts chapter 24 at the very end. And in Acts chapter 24, we have Paul going through one more of the numerous trials that he had to endure. And this one is before a Roman governor by the name of Felix. And it's always intrigued me that when Paul witnessed to this Roman governor Felix and his wife, that he didn't say, 
And we have the words that he did use recorded for us in Acts 24. He didn't say, Felix, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. He didn't say that. He didn't say, Felix, God offers you an abundant life. He can help your troubled marriage. He will give you peace and joy. He didn't say that. Because while true, those things aren't really the essence of the gospel. You know what Paul spoke about? Look these verses up when you go home. Acts 24, beginning of verse 24. 24, 24. You know what he talks about? He talks about faith in Christ along with sin, righteousness, and judgment. In other words, he spoke to him about self-control or, or Felix's lack of self-control, sin. And then he speaks about righteousness. And then he speaks about the coming judgment. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's what Paul did. And we can take Paul's example this morning. And we need to understand that when we have opportunities to talk to people, try to work those ideas in. At least one of them, somewhere. Maybe not even in that order. But the gospel is preached regarding sin and righteousness and judgment. Let's pray. Lord, you have called us to be witnesses in this hostile world. A world that will persecute us and may even kill us. And yet we are to move forward through the power of the Holy Spirit, speaking the word of truth to this world. And specifically, sin and righteousness and judgment. Father, I thank you for the instructions that Jesus gave us here in this passage. And I pray that these three words would resonate in our minds and hearts. So that when we do have that opportunity to say something for you, perhaps it will involve one of these ideas. All of these ideas are necessary for a person to come to your son of faith. I thank you, Father, for this teaching, for our time this morning in your word. In your precious son's name. That um, life preserver thing really stuck out to me this morning. You know, you think about if you're in the middle of an ocean and you're going to drown, you don't even think twice about taking life preserver. But when we go through everyday life and have stuff that we're, oh, I got it, I'm, I'm in control, I can do it, we are so wrong. My screensaver at work is a picture of Jesus standing on top of the water reaching down into the water with his hand, like, take my hand. And a couple years ago, I put that on there, I was going through a valley, and it was just, I have that reminder every day that it doesn't matter what it is, whether I'm physically drowning, or I'm just struggling. You know, Jesus came to save us from ourselves, and I need that reminder every day, so I look at that picture, and it just reminds me. So, um, now is a reminder to us as to what we should do as Christians and how we should treat other people. So if you would stand, we'll close our worship today.
all take that message through our week and just be an example to others. Have a blessed week.